Welcome back to our Balkan road trip. We're at day six now, leaving the Adriatic coast and driving across the border to Mostar, our first city in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Like many cities in the Balkans, Mostar has a multi-ethnic population. For centuries, and even during the long period of Muslim Ottoman rule, Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, Muslim Bosniaks and Bosnian Jews all lived in relatively peaceful coexistence. With peace came prosperity, and Mostar, along the main trade route of the Balkans, grew to become one of the most important trading centers in the region. The Stari Most, or Old Bridge, built by the Ottomans in 1566, was an engineering marvel and a tourist attraction in its time. The magnificent stone bridge, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is a symbol of Mostar, in peace and in war. The city was one of many battlegrounds where the ethnic conflicts after the breakup of Yugoslavia played out, and in 1993, the bridge was destroyed by artillery. During the fighting, hardly any building was spared, and an estimated 2,000 people died in that conflict. Although the Stadi Most, along with most of the city center, has been rebuilt, you'll still find traces of war everywhere. I meet up with Mario Badic, a resident of Mostar, a Croat who lived and fought during the war. And like most here, he'd rather not talk about the past anymore. Instead, Mario would rather show visitors like me his beautiful city like his favorite view of Stary Most from this cafe terrace on the banks of the Neretva. Looking at the reconstructed bridge and the Ottoman skyline, it's hard to tell there was once a brutal war fought here. It's even harder to think how anyone could justify destroying such a historic city. Surviving Ottoman villas and bathhouses, including this one converted into a museum, show how more than 500 years of Turkish rule left a lasting imprint on the architecture of Mostar. The humpback old bridge spanning the Neretva River is one of the best examples of Balkan Islamic architecture. The bridge was rebuilt using the original stones and reopened to the public in 2004, reviving an age-old tradition of diving into the river below. Five euro and then I go down. <laughs> it's a masculine ritual that goes back centuries, though some today will die for some money. Another well-preserved Ottoman landmark is a bazaar, occupying the streets around the old bridge. Beware of stuff made in China, though much of what's sold here is still made by local craftsmen. Mostar was an important trading and commercial center during the Ottoman Empire, and they were very popular for jewelry and other copper pieces. Let's meet one of the artisans who's known in this area. Adnan Badza is from a long line of coppersmiths. His decorative copper plates are all shaped, engraved, and polished by hand, using traditional tools and techniques. But Adnan, who is Muslim, with an Orthodox Serb mother, and who's married to a Catholic Croat, is more than just a talented craftsman. He represents the peaceful, multi-ethnic past of Mostar, and hopefully its future. You're a Muslim man, but you make a Catholic oh, no, Christian icons. No icons. problem. In Bosnia and Mostar, yeah, multinational. One's faith was never an issue, up until ultra-nationalists used it to agitate for war. Adnan's best-selling works depict Christian icons like St. George and Holy Mother, and this plate representing the three faiths of Mostar. Orthodox, Church, Catholic, Minaret, uh, together bridge. It's like connecting it's my, the three faiths together. In Mostar before war. It's a symbol of the multicultural city captured in an old picture book he keeps. Uh, look at old bridge. I'm 40 years ago. In another picture, 
at Nan on the street of his shop in happier times. And this, of the same scene, in Ashes After the War. Today, people are free to express their religion and politics despite their ethnic differences, spending less of their energy dwelling on past hatreds, and more time rediscovering their unique city and their common heritage. If you're looking for remnants of the war, you'll find a lot of it still in Mostar, but that would be the wrong approach to the city. Mostar was always multicultural, and as we heard from the locals, will continue to be. So instead, I'd rather leave this city with this final impression behind me. You have the Catholic Church on one side, the mosque, and then the Orthodox Church over there, all linked together by the Mostar Bridge. We're back on the road, headed to Sarajevo, another Bosnian city torn apart by the recent Balkan War. The majestic Bosnian mountainscape helps you forget the ethnic cleansing that once took place here. Jablanica is the halfway point between Mostar and Sarajevo, Bosnia's capital. It's also where some of the most stunning views of the Neretva River and the mountains of Herzegovina are found. Their spit roast lamb is well known throughout the area and slow roasted by hand. The lamb is roasted over coal and in its own drippings of fat. Bosnian cuisine is typically Balkan, but there's a surprising element of Austro-Hungarian as well, the empire that ruled after the Ottomans. Lamb, however, is the meat of choice, and our new guide from Albanian experience, Alexander Hila, reminds me that unlike his native Albania, the Muslims of Bosnia don't eat pork. We make our way to Sarajevo just as the snow starts to fall, entering the Bosnian capital through Sniper Alley. The residents of Sarajevo during the siege were picked off by snipers on buildings and hills above the city. It's a snowy Sarajevo. Yeah. <laughs> snow and cold Sarajevo. Hello. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I meet Halid Hossi, our local guide in the middle of a rare snowstorm in late April. It's nothing, of course compared to what residents of Sarajevo had to endure during the siege of the city by Serbian forces from 1992 to 1996. Halid's tour starts at a former city hall and national library, a striking architectural monument mixing Catholic Habsburg and Islamic Moorish elements. What stands today is a reconstruction of the original, which was reduced to rubble during the siege. You can, you can see the mountain behind these hills. Uh, Serbian soldiers actually used uh, specific uh, flammable shells to burn as much as they could. One of the most poignant photos of the siege was of a man playing his cello from the ruins of the library. The Ottoman quarter of the city, Baskarsia, was devastated and those who roamed outside risked being shot by snipers or hit by mortars. Life is back to normal now, and Baskarsia is again a magnet for shoppers and worshippers. The 16th century Ghazi Husrev Beg Mosque, like so many cultural landmarks targeted on purpose during the siege, has been rebuilt to its former glory. The Baskarsia neighborhood is also where you'll find authentic Bosnian delicacies, like a local version of Turkish coffee. Savory Bosnian meat pies are another specialty. These are baked the traditional way in a cast iron bell and charcoal. Pumpkin, potato, and sheep's cheese pies are also popular here. Locals love their version of the kebab, sevap chichi spicy cylinders of ground beef and lamb served in a pita bread pocket with lots of onions. From the Ottoman side, we now make our way to the newer Austro-Hungarian part of the city. So it's like east and west, eastern and western architecture in one place, so we can use to say that Sarajevo is a meeting of the cultures. On the western side is a Sacred Heart Cathedral, 
where Pope John Paul II spoke out against the war. In front of it is a Sarajevo rose, a memorial made from shrapnel that killed innocent civilians standing outside the cathedral. The Sarajevo rose, actually the place where the mortal shell uh, landed and killed innocent people. So it actually, exactly, right here, right here. So uh, sometimes people were waiting there, like turn to get bread, water or something like that. And then the bomb, the mortal shell actually landed from nowhere and uh, killed them. Sarajevo is no stranger to violence. It was here, right on the street corner across the Latin bridge, where in June 1914, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a Bosnian Serb. A shot that triggered World War I and the end of the Habsburg Empire in the Balkans. Unfortunately, Sarajevo is remembered by most people around the world for two things, and both of them bloody and violent. The assassination of the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, and the other, the siege of Sarajevo. The longest siege in modern history. However, there's so much more Sarajevo can be proud of. And we saw it tonight. For the generation of Halid, who are too young to remember the siege, their Sarajevo is a vibrant, multi-ethnic and cosmopolitan city full of opportunity. Indeed, everyone I talk to here would rather move on and reject the vicious cycle of hostility. On our third part of our series on the Balkans, we'll visit Croatia, another former Republic of Yugoslavia that has fully recovered from the war of the 90s. We'll drive along the Dalmatian coast to explore the walled cities of Split and Dubrovnik. We'll trek through the natural wonders of the Plitvice lakes and spend some time in the cosmopolitan capital Zagreb. Till then, thanks for watching. I'm David Seldran, and this is Executive Class.